the Jews. History of a people. Jerusalem, 450 BC. For centuries, the city has been fought over. Time and again, the Jewish people have been at the mercy of superior conquerors. After a long captivity in Babylon, the Jews are finally allowed to return to their homeland. In Jerusalem, the last to arrive are being impatiently awaited. They are being led by the priest and scribe Ezra. He and his followers bring gold and jewelry with them. Jerusalem must be resurrected and be the center of the Jewish faith, the belief in the one God. With Ezra's help, the Jews want to rebuild the temple that the Babylonians destroyed. Ezra's knowledge and his patience are vaunted everywhere. Soon the people of Jerusalem will vote him their religious leader. They kept their people's memories and stories in the foreign land. The creation of the world, the first people and the great flood. Stories of heroes and warriors full of wonder and mystery. Revelations and laws of their God. Now they're compiling all of these religious traditions for the rest of time. Thus, the Torah was created, the book of teaching and the law. To this day, this book stands at the center of the Jewish religion. But the Torah is not of significance only for Jews. It resembles the first five books of the Old Testament, the first part of the Christian Bible. The Torah is one of our few sources concerning the origin of the Jewish people. The book of Exodus plays a central role. It tells a dramatic story that probably began more than 3,000 years ago. It is written that God appeared to the shepherd Moses in a burning bush and gave him a mission. I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. For 400 years, the Jews have lived in Egyptian servitude. Now Moses begs Pharaoh, let my people go. But the Egyptian ruler declines. So God brings plagues and natural disasters onto the land. And when all the firstborn of the Egyptians die, Pharaoh lets the Israelites go free. But he sends his soldiers in pursuit. The book of Exodus tells the fate of the Israelites. With God's help, they manage to escape through the sea. The Egyptians drown in the floods. Moses is leading the Israelites through the desert. What keeps them going is their hope for God's promised land. Young and old, men, women and children. 600,000 people, so it is said. And their goal is freedom, a life without slavery. To this day, Jews celebrate Passover and remember their exodus, their flight from Egypt. It is said that they left quickly and in secret. There was no time to prepare sourdough for their bread. That's why Jews still eat matzah at Passover, the unleavened bread. They also eat salted eggs, bitter herbs and other foods whose color and texture resemble Egyptian clay and whose taste reminds them of bitter times. Today, Passover is the focal point because it means liberation, not just the liberation of Israel and the beginning of the history of the Jewish people. Up to that time, history was, as is told by Genesis, the history of the individual, patriarchs of families and of clans. But in Exodus, Israel enters the world stage as a people, divided into tribes, it is true, but they are a unit. This history begins with liberation, but that also means that Passover is a symbol of freedom. The basic freedom that everyone is entitled to, not just Israel. The path to freedom is hard. In the third month, the fugitives reach Sinai. This peninsula lies between Egypt and modern-day Israel. The Israelites are said to have fought their way to the Promised Land through this inhospitable environment. They don't have enough water or food. Every day is a test. Is God really with them? On Mount Sinai, so it is written in the Bible, God appears to Moses once more. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me from among all peoples. The 2,300 meter Jabal Musa, the mountain of Moses, is said to be the place where this covenant was made. To this day, it's a place of great significance for Jews, Christians and Muslims alike. Moses brings two stone tablets with him from the summit into which the Ten Commandments are chiseled. 
they regulate people's relationship to God and are also the ethical bedrock of civilization. The first commandments are, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image nor any likeness. Shocking commandments, new and alien. All the other cultures all around worship many gods and make likenesses and statues of them. The Israelites alone are to believe their God to be so great that there is no room for other gods and that no image could represent him. Again and again Moses reminds the people of God's words. And if you shall reject my statutes and break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will appoint terror over you, even consumption and fever that shall consume the eyes and make the soul to pine away. The Torah contains a further 603 injunctions. They regulate the whole of life, from waking to sleeping, from the cradle to the grave. It's the duty of every Jew to follow them, but they also give security and strength in the ebb and flow of history in every place on earth. One important commandment also demands the circumcision of every male Jew eight days after his birth. Just like their forefathers, every male Jewish infant is circumcised eight days after his birth as a symbol of his covenant with God. This important symbolic act marks his initiation into the Jewish world and is celebrated with a big party. This covenant is of great importance for the people of Israel. It's very difficult to live such a covenant because the human being must be convinced that it's not only his acts that speak of his relationship with God, but also his body. Circumcision is a painful, incomprehensible step that frightens parents before they do this to their son. The prayer straps, known as tefillin, also remind faithful Jews of the unbreakable covenant with God. Every little box contains four Torah texts written on parchment. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. It is written that the Israelites wandered through the desert for forty years. Then they reached Mount Nebo in modern-day Jordan. It was here that Moses set eyes on the promised land, and once again he heard God's voice. This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. Moses was never to reach the destination of their long journey. He died and was buried at an unknown location. Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. To this day it remains the land of longing for many Jews. According to biblical dating, the Israelites entered Canaan around 1300 BC. There they met other peoples with whom they will be at war time and again over the coming centuries. On their way to the Promised Land, the Israelites carry the Ark of the Covenant with them. They keep the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments that sealed their contract with God in this golden chest. The portable shrine is the visible sign for them and their enemies. God is always with us. After conquering the land, the Israelites are said to have congregated in Shiloh for the time being, which is between Jerusalem and modern-day Nablus. For the first time, they have a fixed center for their shrine. The time of wandering seems over. The nomads become settled. But was their exodus really as the Bible tells it? Many scholars today doubt this account. The conquest of Canaan by the Israelites is also contested. Indefatigable archaeologists are looking for definitive traces. Israel Finkelstein from the University of Tel Aviv questions many biblical events. Archaeology has shown in the last century or so that many of the sites which are mentioned in the text in relation to the conquest story simply did not exist, were not inhabited at that time. And secondly, we know today that the fall of the Canaanite system, Egypto-Canaanite system, was a long process. We are not dealing with a military conquest of Canaan by a group of people who march under one leadership and take, you know, one city after the other. The Torah isn't a historical treatise. 
It's a book of faith in which the birth of a people is recorded. The shrine has its place in Shiloh, but at the moment it's still a tabernacle, a tent, a portable temple as a symbol of the unconsolidated condition of the young state. Many hundreds of years later, Ezra, the priest, and other scholars write down the history of their ancestors. This is how the Israelites are said to have settled in different places after their exodus. Only weakly allied with each other, they were, however, surrounded by powerful enemies. The Israelites were dissatisfied, so it is written. Their tribal leaders, the judges, were no longer adequate. The demands of the people grew louder and louder. That we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us and fight our battles. It is intended that the old judge Samuel, who was living in Shiloh, should anoint this king. The wise Samuel accepts the task, even though he warns of the dangers of an abuse of power. But his objections fall on deaf ears, and so Saul becomes the first king of Israel, and the loose association of tribes. Becomes a state. The main enemies of Saul and his young kingdom are the Philistines. The maritime nation has a well-organized army and powerful weapons. They steal the Ark of the Covenant more than once. In their fight against the Philistines, it is one Israelite in particular who attracts attention: the shepherd boy David. With a simple slingshot, he subdued the huge Philistine Goliath. King Saul is jealous of young David. He fears him as a rival and exiles him. In exile, David makes a name for himself as a relentless warrior. David and his soldiers are in a war camp when a messenger arrives at the tent. He has tragic news. The messenger says, "He only just managed to escape the enemy. He says he has Saul's headdress and his armband. Saul fell in the battle against the Philistines. David appears shaken." The king is dead. According to tradition, he tore his shirt. Honest mourning or cold calculation? Only a short while later, David is crowned king. David conquers the town of Jebus from the Jebusites living there. From now on, it is called Jerusalem, and he is victorious against the invading Philistines. Very soon, the king is ruling over a large kingdom. So it is written in the Bible. The city of Jerusalem is the new capital. It is here that David brings the Holy of Holies of the Israelites, the Ark of the Covenant, with the stone tablets of the law. The oldest part of the city still carries his name today, Ir David, City of David. There are hardly any finds from the legendary times of King David and his son Solomon. In order to crown his life's work, David wants to build God a temple, but God fends him off. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. It was only David's son Solomon who built the first temple on a hill near the city of David. Now the city is not only the seat of the king, but also the centre of the faith. According to the Bible, there was a room in the interior of the temple that was only accessible to the high priests. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto its place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. The Bible remains the only testimony to the temple's existence. An exact search for evidence of remains of the legendary building is not possible for religious and political reasons, because these days the Muslim Dome of the Rock and the Al Aqsa Mosque stand here. After Solomon's death, the kingdom breaks into two: Israel in the north and Judea in the south. For more than 200 years, they live side by side in hostile coexistence, always in danger of being overrun by a more powerful enemy. Right into the eighth century, their religious customs are hardly different from those of other peoples around the Mediterranean. Monotheism hasn't yet asserted itself. At this time, they still worship other gods besides the one god, such as the ancient bull god El. From time to time, God even has a wife, the ancient Syrian goddess Ashera. 
It's a good time for prophets, articulate men who warn of a return to pagan customs. Fearless, they make themselves into the voice of God's messages. They are both social critics and soothsayers. The prophet Jeremiah is one of those who demands penance and a return to stricter ways. Otherwise, God would send a terrible tribunal and Jerusalem would perish. For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem, or who shall bemoan thee, or who shall turn aside to ask of thy welfare? Thou hast rejected me, saith the Lord, thou art gone backward. The threats from external enemies are growing. Within the city walls there is hardly a single well. The abundant Gion source lies outside of the city walls. Then, in the 8th century, Hezekiah, king of Judea, plans an extraordinary project, the building of a tunnel for water. And so it is also written in the Bible. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper spring of the waters of Gion and brought them straight down on the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. In 586 BC, the Babylonians conquer Jerusalem. Jeremiah's prophecies come true. Then the king of Babylon slew the sons of Zedekiah in Riblah before his eyes, and the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people with fire and break down the walls of Jerusalem. This is what the book of Jeremiah writes about the event that was to change the fate of Judea for a long time to come. The Babylonian ruler, Nebuchadnezzar II, has yet more plans for Judea's population. After the destruction of Jerusalem, he takes the Judean upper class to Babylon as spoils of war. The simple people are allowed to stay in the country or emigrate to neighboring Egypt. The Judeans have lost their religious center and their land. Jerusalem is in ashes. Judea is assimilated into the Babylonian kingdom that stretches from the Mediterranean to Persia. In the center of this vast empire lies the legendary city of Babylon. It is the time of Nebuchadnezzar II. Babylon is a city of superlatives. Witnesses are awestruck by its magnificence. The houses are built of solid brick walls. The Tower of Babel is legendary and the hanging gardens are among the seven wonders of the ancient world. In around 500 BC, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote, Babylon wasn't just a fairly large city, but it was also the most beautiful city of all the ones we know of. At the beginning of the 20th century, the German archaeologist Robert Koldewey excavated a city that had long been forgotten. Most Judeans are living a good life in their Babylonian exile. Women and children can move about freely and many men are working as officials at the court. The generations that grow up here only know their home from the stories of the elders. Their memories sound like a promise. By the waters of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered thee, O Sion. They called Jerusalem Zion the city chosen by God and his people. For them, it was the embodiment of the promised land. Their hope to one day return and their faith in their God united them in these foreign lands. In 539 BC, the Persian king Cyrus conquers Babylon and allows the Judeans to return home. Some decide to stay and found the Babylonian community that was to remain in existence for more than 2,000 years. Cyrus thus ensured himself an important place in Jewish history. For many scholars, the history of the Jews begins with the return from exile. This is the first time they speak of Jews. They are faced by a great challenge. Ezra and other scholars compile the Torah from writings and other traditions. It reinforces the confidence of a small country that could always fall victim to its superior neighbors again. The goals of the people in Jerusalem in late monarchic times, before the destruction, and the goals of the temple community without a kingdom, after they came back from Babylonia, are the same goals. And both are dealing with giving an identity 
and with building the boundaries for the nation. And both do that with mainly two platforms. There's the platform of the law, which is extremely important, the book of Deuteronomy and so on. And then there's the second platform, the platform of history, which explains how it all began, what happened, what went wrong, how it can be fixed, and what to do in, in order to have a better future. And the history part is also extremely important for giving the framework, the boundaries, the ethnic boundaries, the identity. The Shrine of the Book is in the Israel Museum. Here, the oldest Torah texts that have been so far found are kept. They are copies of copies. They come from Qumran on the Dead Sea. They were written down at around 240 BC. The Torah became the most influential text of the past two and a half thousand years. Its triumphant march also resulted from its being part of the Christian Bible. For devout Jews, the Torah isn't a text that developed over time, but a godly revelation. Every Torah roll has to be treated with the utmost care and can only be written by hand. The Sofer, the Torah writer, needs years of practice. Every one of the 300,000 letters is carefully formed. Since it's seen as a living object, it's only allowed to be made of natural materials. It is written on vellum with a turkey or goose quill. Utmost concentration is required because any mistake would make the Torah unusable. As befits its sacred status, the Torah is kept in a special ark, the Holy Ark, as it is here in the synagogue in Augsburg. Every time it's taken out of the shrine, the cantor sings a song in its honor. For its protection and decoration, it is enveloped in decorative velvet and fitted with a crown of silver and gold. The envelope is only taken off for a reading. One can't imagine Judaism and the Jewish people without the Torah. But now one has to ask, what does the Torah mean? Is it the five books of Moses per se, or the whole body of Jewish wisdom and teaching that arise from the Torah? And we have to take the Torah as a whole, and not just the five books of Moses in the narrow sense. Of course, they are the anchor point of the whole, but there is a vast body of literature that is based on the Torah and that comes out of the Torah. And the whole of Jewish life in all its aspects is shaped by the Torah. So without a Torah, there would be no Judaism, no Jewish people. It became the constitution of the Jews in the middle of the 5th century. In 332 BC, the Greek Macedonian ruler Alexander the Great conquers the Mediterranean's east coast. Soon, Judea also belongs to his vast realm. Even though Alexander's empire fell apart shortly after his death, Hellenic civilization influenced the entire region for centuries to come. Numerous cities were constructed on the Greek model. One of the most important is Marissa. These days, there is little evidence of the city's former size in Israel's barren landscape. The whole mountain is covered in a network of caves and cisterns made by the one-time inhabitants of Marissa. One of the biggest is the Columbarium Cave. Pigeons were bred in 2,000 niches as homing pigeons, sacrificial animals or simply as food. The Necropolis, which is Greek for city of the dead, that is, a cemetery. It has only recently been restored. Greek culture, their sense of beauty and their worldly joie de vivre pervade the everyday lives of the Jewish inhabitants. The rich upper class is particularly fascinated. The stately tombstones, such as those here in the Kidron Valley in Jerusalem, have Greek models. The superficiality of the foreigners and their influence alarms the devout Jews. In the first book of the Maccabees, it is written that, whereupon they built a place of exercise at Jerusalem according to the customs of the heathen, and made themselves uncircumcised, and forsook the holy covenant, and joined themselves to the heathen. Judas is the scion of an old Jewish line of priests. Right from the start, he's brought up to despise Greek culture. 
The polytheism of the occupying forces is idolatry and therefore a grave crime. It angers his father, the priest Mattathias. Particularly those Jews who conform too much are an abomination to him. The situation escalates. In 178 BC, the successors of the Greek ruler Alexander attack Jerusalem and dedicate the temple to the god Zeus. King Antiochus forbids the reading of the Torah and circumcision. He sends soldiers to force the population to worship Greek gods. They come to Modi'im, the home village of Judas and his family. The priest Mattathias adjures the inhabitants. God forbid that we should forsake the law and the ordinances. In a rage, Mattathias kills the commander-in-chief. The family flees into the mountains. Soon, more and more followers come to join them. For many decades, the rebels fight the occupation. After his father's death, Judas takes over the leadership. He gets the epithet Maccabi, the hammer. His biggest triumph? Judas Maccabeus reconquers the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and drives off the Hellenized Jews. He destroys the statue of Zeus and dedicates the temple to the God of the Jews again. On the 25th of Kislev, the third month of the Jewish calendar. According to legend, only a small bottle of ritual oil was left. It is said to have fed the flame of the menorah, the seven-branched candelabrum, for eight days. The fundamental message of the Hanukkah miracle is addition. Just as we add a candle every day until we have eight, so too every Jew and every human being should become better every day and should never be satisfied with what they have already accomplished. Since 1995, the Jewish community in Frankfurt has been openly celebrating Hanukkah again. In the second book of the Maccabees, it is written that they ordained also by a common statute and decree that every year those days should be kept of the whole nation of the Jews. The celebration of the dedication of the temple marks the glorious climax of the revolt. The story of the heroic resistance of the Maccabees is told to this day. When Judas died, his brothers continued the fight. His descendants continued to rule the independent state for another 200 years. In 66 BC, the Roman general Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus conquers Asia Minor. Judea becomes part of the Roman province of Syria and is incorporated into the Roman superpower. From now on, the city on the Tiber will determine the fate of the Jewish people. Here, a man enters the political arena who is despised by the Jewish people and feared by them because of his unscrupulousness, Herod the Great. The Roman Senate declares Herod king of Judea. Rome will protect him as long as he represents Rome's interests. He survives several changes of power at the head of the Roman state through charm and diplomacy. When he ascends his Judean throne, the real power behind him is actually Rome. The king reciprocates. He builds a huge port on the Mediterranean coast. It becomes the biggest town in Judea, bigger even than Jerusalem. In honor of the Roman Caesars, he names it Caesarea Maritima. Herod commissions the best engineers. The city was not to be inferior to Roman examples in any way. The artificial harbour complex becomes the biggest in the eastern Mediterranean. There's enough space for an entire Roman legion. Herod is mostly concerned about the effect of the huge buildings. He wants to modernise the state and impress his subjects. The port of Caesarea is a destination for trading ships from all across the Roman world. A tax-free zone is created to attract wealthy potential traders. Caesarea becomes the showpiece of the entire region. Luxurious villas, a forum, theatre, public baths and different temples are all to be found there. Added to this is a circus in which chariot races take place. The city regularly hosts sporting contests and other mass events. Herod personally experienced the power of Roman architecture. 
He saw the force and charisma of the temples, theatres, circuses with his own eyes. That's why he wanted to introduce them in his realm too, because he saw in them the pinnacle of culture. He probably wasn't a great intellectual. Jerusalem also still bears the signature of Herod. Everywhere the remains of his imposing construction projects are to be found. The Cardo, the great shopping street, still runs through Jerusalem's old town. Nearby, archaeologists excavated Herod's residential area in the 1970s. This is where the rich and beautiful lived as luxuriously as they did in Rome, with baths, floor heating and elaborately painted walls. The majority of the people remain suspicious. They see the ambitious parvenu Herod as a lackey of the Romans. The king curries favor among the people. One major building project is meant to silence the critics, particularly the devout Jews. A new temple is proposed, which will even eclipse Solomon's temple. It is designed to have an inner courtyard which can accommodate vast crowds of pilgrims. This is how Herod wants to go down in history. His plan works. For a while, Herod even manages to unite religious splinter groups. The construction of the temple doesn't just increase the prestige of the king, but also that of the Jewish religion in the world. It also breathes new life into Judean trade, and Jerusalem becomes a metropolis in which 100,000 people live. Herod, however, doesn't live to see its dedication. He dies 60 years earlier. Even 2,000 years later, the size of the area gives an idea of the overwhelming impression that the complex must have made on its visitors. By far the most famous city of the East is what the Roman writer Pliny the Elder called ancient Jerusalem. The Romans ruled Judea. The king they installed, Herod, has died. Revolts break out. Herod had unified the kingdom, but now Rome divides the state. Jerusalem is in unrest. Religious parties are arguing about the occupation. At the temple, the most sacred place in the city, the different views clash. Many hope for the Messiah, a savior promised by God. He will, so they believe, end this foreign rule and finally bring about eternal peace. Criticism of both the Roman occupation and the Jewish upper class and their relationship to religion is becoming louder. In particular, for devout Jews, the goings-on outside the temple are an affront to God. In the eyes of his followers, the preacher Jesus is the Messiah. For the Romans, he is a rabble-rouser. They crucify him. Nobody suspects that his death is the birth of a new world religion, closely linked with the fate of the Jewish people. Unfortunately, Jesus is representative of the whole history of Christian anti-Judaism. Because it was assumed that he was the son of God, and the notion of his being the Messiah, plays a central role in Christianity. Coupled with the rejection of Jesus by Judaism that says Jesus is not the Messiah, that naturally leads to this long history of Christian anti-Judaism that persists to this day. Crucifixion is a common form of punishment that the Romans use against tiresome rabble-rousers, but the early Christians don't blame the Romans for the death of Jesus, they blame the Jewish people. For them, Judas Iscariot becomes the embodiment of the greedy traitor, and gradually he comes to be seen as the embodiment of the Jew, plain and simple. To this day, the fabricated caricature serves them as justification for their hostility to the Jews. That Jesus was a Jew himself is conveniently forgotten. A few decades later, the Zealots, a radical religious group, have taken over the power in Jerusalem. They want to liberate the land from the Romans. For two years, Roman legions besiege the city where refugees from the entire region are hiding out. Only grave diggers are allowed to leave Jerusalem. In order to prevent the spread of disease, the dead are buried outside of the city walls. This time, they're transporting a special load. The wise rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai has passed away, they claim, and their sorrow is immense. At this time, hardly anyone still believes in the victory of the Jewish rebels. The superiority of the Roman enemy is just too great. The further fate of the rabbi is recounted by a Jewish legend. 
So it happened that Yohanan ben Zakkai managed to escape from Jerusalem alive in a wooden coffin. The rabbi isn't out to save his own life, but the faith and the knowledge of his people, his memories and his hopes. He's planning a new religious center far away from the besieged metropolis. If Jerusalem is lost, at least the spirit of Jewry must have a new home. A little while later, the Romans occupy the city and destroy the temple. The Jewish chronicler Flavius Josephus writes, The temple mount seemed to glow from the ground up because it was surrounded by fire. But even fuller than the river of flames were the rivers of blood that were flowing. The West Wall, also called the Wailing Wall, supported the temple plateau. It is both a place for pilgrims and a synagogue. For centuries, Jews from all over the world have been attaching notes with wishes and prayers to the wall. The symbolic power and the connection of modern Jewry with the Jewry of ancient times, for that the West Wall is a connecting link, between the old Jewish state and the new Jewish state, the worldwide diaspora, and I think this West Wall can't leave a single Jew in the whole world entirely cold, never mind how undevout or secular they say they are. Everyone who has ever been there or who is standing in front of this West Wall will start saying a prayer or perhaps even attaching a note to the wall. Today, too, those praying repeat the psalm. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. For most Jews, Jerusalem will always stay alive in their hearts. The chronicler Flavius Josephus reports that the Romans take 97,000 Jewish prisoners. Many end up on the imperial slave markets. The Roman emperor Titus celebrates his victory with a triumphal procession through Rome. He's carrying the stolen temple treasures the menorah, the seven-branched candelabra, and the trombones with him. The Arch of Titus in Rome commemorates this event. To this day, Jews refuse to pass through it. But what happened to the temple treasures? Flavius Josephus writes that the price of gold fell by 50% in the Middle East. That's how much Titus stole in Jerusalem. Scholars suspect that Emperor Vespasian and his son financed expensive buildings in Rome with the booty. As Jerusalem falls, Yohanan ben Zakkai and his retinue are traveling to the Mediterranean coast. They intend to found the new religious center in the small town of Yavni. Here they want to make the Torah the focal point of studies and teaching. Soon Yavni comes close to the importance of Jerusalem. There are only speculations about the exact location of the religious academy. Since 2005, a team from Bar Ilan University has been systematically looking for remains. Amongst them is Avi Solomon, and he has a big dream. It's the dream of an archaeologist and a devout Jew. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai renewed Judaism in Yavni. The religion that was organized around the temple became the religion that longed for the temple. That's why it would be a big thing for me if after 2,000 years of diaspora and exile I could find this place again where the tradition of this new form of the religion began. Yohanan ben Zakkai implements far-reaching reforms. He abolishes animal sacrifice, which has been the custom in the temple. Communal prayer and the study of the Torah take its place. The menorah becomes the symbol for the holy city of Jerusalem and the lost temple. Some mosaics of the time are now in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. They decorated the floors of ancient synagogues. That's the name given to the Jews' places of congregation in which they also commemorate their history. In Gamla, in the Golan Heights, archaeologists found one of Israel's earliest synagogues. After the fall of Jerusalem, many Jews fled to this inhospitable area. The form of the hall, the multi-leveled rows of benches and the structure of the columns are typical of synagogues dating back to this time. They're oriented towards Jerusalem, the holy city. Such houses of congregation already existed before the destruction of the temple, but now their significance changed. After the destruction, the synagogue gained a new meaning, a new purpose. 
and that purpose was the center for a new kind of worship. Prayer, of course, had always existed in, on an individual level, mostly spontaneous, but the rabbis sought to create a fixed sort of prayer, an obligatory prayer, which would take place at very specific times of day. And the rabbis themselves say quite explicitly that the prayers are meant to replace the sacrifices that were brought at the same times in the temple. To this day, the communal prayer is of great significance. A service can only take place when at least 10 men are present. Only then is the presence of God, the Shekinah, guaranteed. Any place could be a synagogue if Jews come together with a Torah for prayer. After the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple, the survivors flee right to the edge of the desert into the vicinity of the Dead Sea. Herod had erected the fortress Masada on the huge rock plateau. It was considered unassailable for a long time. Already during the siege of Jerusalem, Jewish rebels had locked themselves into the mountain. It is their last haven. Rome sends 8,000 legionaries to Masada. The floor plans of their camps are still recognizable today. The Jerusalem archaeologist Guy Stiebel is fascinated by the dramatic history of the siege of Masada. According to the Jewish chronicler Flavius Josephus, the siege ends in tragedy. The Jews were here after seven years or eight years of fighting in Judea. They knew what happened in Jerusalem. They knew what happened in Jodapata, at Gamla and other places. So they could not be optimistic. And when you realize that, you, it can actually lead you to the understanding of why they were thinking about committing suicide. I mean, as, as a possibility. For three years, the besieged hold out. From above, they can closely watch all of the Roman actions and hear their voices. The Romans force Jewish prisoners to build a huge ramp. Then they roll the battering ram up and attack the wall of the fortress. The discoveries of the archaeologists corroborate this part of the story as recounted by the chronicler Josephus. But the final scenes of the drama lie in the dark. Did the rebels really draw lots for the 11 men that killed nearly a thousand others before they killed themselves? What is truth and what is heroic legend? Because so far archaeologists have only recovered 32 skeletons. A large proportion of the finds are stored in the University of Jerusalem. Among them 700 ostraca, inscribed clay shards. 11 of them have names. Are these the lots Flavius Josephus writes about? It is certainly true that the name of Ben Jair is written on one of them, the name of the rebel leader. For me, the most exciting discoveries that are being made at Masada are the inscriptions and the fact that we have so many of them here, written in Hebrew, written here 2,000 years ago. And I think that if we speak about the resurrection of the dry bones, uh, literally such, such a fragment was actually found here, the fact that Jewish people came back to this land. So if you want to demonstrate the continuation, this string of life is, for me, is the fact that both my boys can read Hebrew letters that were written 2,000 years ago. Masada is a symbol of the Jews' perseverance. Here they believe with particular conviction in the recreation of Israel as it is prophesied in the Bible. Particularly during the 1940s, Jews were drawn to this mysterious place. Some had survived the Holocaust in Europe. They too left inscriptions for future generations. And to this day, Israeli soldiers pledge in their swearing in, Masada must never be allowed to fall again. In 135 AD, Emperor Hadrian put down the last revolt of the Jews. After the destruction of the temple, the Romans had already had coins stamped with the inscription Judea Capta, Judea Captured. Now they destroy Jerusalem completely and erect a new city. They rename the province of Judea Syria Palestina. Jews are prohibited from settling in this land. Many flee to already established communities. The Roman historian Strabo writes, The last are already in nearly every city on earth and it's not easy to find a place on this earth that doesn't house this people. Some stay in northern Palestine, close to their holy city.
Bet Shirim in Galilee becomes the spiritual magnet in this region. It is possibly the site of the once famous yeshiva, the Academy of Rabbi Judah Hanasi. Many scholars and students come to study the Torah. Judah Hanasi also taught oral traditions. They have been handed down for generations. At the beginning of the third century, Abba ben Avihu arrives in Bet Shirim. He comes from an important family in Babylon. His ancestry goes back to King David. Judah Hanasi becomes his teacher with a great goal. The time is coming when people will look for and not find guidance in the Torah, when they will look for and not find the teachings of the learned. Many answers to questions of everyday life are still only handed down orally. Together with his students, Judah Hanasi begins to write down the so-called oral Torah. What is created is the Mishnah, a compilation of all guidelines and teachings for a life in the spirit of the Torah. We discover that in many respects, both the law of the Mishnah and the form in which it records it is quite new. The Mishnah is far more new than it is old, uh, far more innovative or even revolutionary because it had to address a very, very revolutionary period, a period that was literally unprecedented. Therefore, it went forward in very bold ways, keeping what it could of the old, but forging ahead with the new in a very aggressive fashion. The Mishnah helps devout Jews to live the laws of the Torah in everyday life. So too with the dietary laws known as kashrut, that prescribe what can be eaten and what cannot. The Jews differentiate between kosher, pure, and trefa, impure. This holds for all food and its preparation. One of the many laws of the Torah is, thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. For the family from Jerusalem, that means that they mustn't cook and eat milk and meat together. At their table, there is no meal that combines these two. For the kitchen, this means separate fridges, sinks, tablecloths, pots and cutlery. In the Jewish kindergarten Gan Israel in Berlin, two kitchen areas are completely separated because of this. On the left, they prepare milky things, and on the right, meaty things. Amongst animals, they also distinguish between pure and impure. Kosher are fish with scales, most poultry, and cloven-hoofed animals that chew the cud. You will find many, many Jews who don't care very much about kashrut at all who will refuse to eat pork or other pig products because this became a very powerful symbol of what Jews shouldn't eat. And even today, for those who don't care about the technicalities of the law, when Jews want to eat as Jews, that sometimes means something as simple as not eating the product of the pig. Kashrut also applies to drinks. Wine grower Christopher Koenig from Alsace produces kosher wine. He's regularly visited by Gabi Jalosinski, a rabbi from Strasbourg who checks every production step. He alone is allowed to break the seal of the barrels. Because wine is only kosher when no non-Jew has come into contact with it. The Strasbourg congregation needs wine for ritual purposes and also trades in it. Two percent of the proceeds go to the needy. That's another condition for the kosher label. We are a people of traditions. Respect of traditions is what mainly allows the Jewish people to continue to exist to this day. If one were to try to modernize or modify our traditions, it would be the downfall of the Jewish people, even if you can sometimes ask yourself if they make sense. After the loss of Jerusalem and the Temple, the Torah and the Mishnah become important sources of identity. The Jews are now a nation without a land, but their writings ensure their unity as a religious community. Once a people of the temple, they are now a people of the writings. Abba is appointed rabbi. Now he is allowed to make decisions in ritual questions and civil judgments. Thus distinguished, he returns to Babylon. He wants to bring his knowledge to the Jews of his homeland. When his teacher, Judah Hanasi, dies at the beginning of the third century, the sorrow for the famous rabbi is great. He is buried in the necropolis of Bet Shirim. After Jerusalem, it's one of the most important Jewish cemeteries. Many have themselves buried here right into the Middle Ages, in the soil of the Holy Land. The mortal remains are brought from far away, from Syria, the Lebanon, Egypt, and Babylon. Abba returns to his Babylonian home. Many Jewish communities have been in existence here for 700 years. 
Abba's destinations are the great centers of Jewish teaching on the Euphrates, Pambiditha, Nahadia, and Sura. In Sura, the Jewish scholar founds an academy that's soon known as the Little Shrine. Abba makes the laws and rules from Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, known in Babylon. He's now called Rav, teacher of the entire diaspora. His authority is generally accepted. Soon the schools in Babylon surpass those of the old homeland. Together with other scholars, Abba writes a great work that will shape Jewish religion to this day. In its current form, the Babylonian Talmud, as it's called, contains 6,000 pages and addresses questions of all areas of life. It is made up of the Mishnah and commentaries from nearly 3,000 rabbis from three continents. A page resembles the cross-section of a tree trunk. In its center is the Mishnah, around it like growth rings on trees, the commentaries from seven centuries. Keep turning it because everything is contained within it. Thus, it is written in the Talmud. Even in foreign lands, it is a kind of portable homeland for Jews that they want to have close to them. Everywhere in the world, be it New York, Jerusalem, or here in Frankfurt, students and teachers are studying and discussing in the Talmud schools. How is a certain law in the Torah to be understood, and how is it applied in practice? What does Rabbi Hillel write, and what does Rabbi Shammai say to this? This way, the Talmud secures the religious laws, keeps the teaching alive, and makes their further development possible. The later knowing joke, which says that if you have you know, two Jews, at least two opinions, probably three, there's no doubt in my mind that the Jewish inclination toward argument originates in the Talmud. Uh, there is a culture of argument in the Talmud which is very powerful. The Talmud recognizes that there's no single truth, that we don't know exactly what God wants of us, so it's important to argue what does God want of us, and different opinions might be equally legitimate, and the Talmud pursues those opinions by and large as though they are legitimate. And when we get to the end of the Talmud, while sometimes decisions are made, very, very often the arguments with which the Talmud began are precisely the same arguments with which it ends, the only difference being we now recognize why each of the different opinions is a good opinion. After its creation, the Talmud soon comes to other communities. The text promotes the spiritual union of the dispersed people. At the end of the sixth century, a new power enters the stage of world history, Islam. The founder of the new religion is the Arabian merchant Muhammad. His visions and revelations are written down in the Quran. Muhammad dreams of a great religion that Jews and Christians are meant to follow too. When these don't accept him as a prophet, he changes his attitude. At first he had wanted to make Jerusalem the religious center of Islam, but he now decides on his own birthplace. Mecca. After the death of Muhammad, his successors conquer the Arabian Peninsula, and soon the Islamic Empire stretches right into North Africa. In 638 AD, Allah's warriors also conquer Jerusalem and renew the prohibition against Jews living in the city. As a symbol of their rule, the Muslims erect the Mosque of Omar on the Temple Mount. Here, Muhammad is said to have risen to heaven with his horse. After Mecca and Medina, Jerusalem also becomes a holy place of Islam. The Arabic Empire, or Islamic Empire, was prosperous and powerful. We often don't realize that between the 8th and the 12th or 13th century, it was the focal point of culture and wealth for the entire Western world. The Jews were part of that, so they quite naturally prospered along with it and they achieved the kind of cultural level that went along with being part of a very culturally sophisticated environment. For the first time since the fall of the temple, most Jews are once again living in a single cultural, political and economic unit. They are allowed to move around freely in the country and practice their religion as long as they abide by the law because for the Muslim ruler they are a people of the book and thus dhimmis, protected persons, as it is written in the Quran. Those who injure a dhimmi injure me, and those who injure me have injured Allah. 
But they don't have the same rights. Jews are not allowed to ride horses or camels, and they're not allowed to bear arms. Whenever they meet a Muslim, they have to greet him reverently. Islam's economic and intellectual metropolis is Baghdad. The city becomes an important cultural and religious center for Jews too. Even in 1948, a quarter of Baghdad's population is still Jewish. Three years later, hundreds of thousands of Jews are expelled from Iraq into the newly founded state of Israel. Right into modern times, the Jews were influential citizens with a largely autonomous administration. At the same time, Baghdad is an important religious reference point for Jews in the entire Muslim region. The advice of the Gayon, the leader of the Jewish community, carries weight. According to what we are told, when the head of the Jewish community in Baghdad came to the palace for an audience with the caliph, a crier would run ahead of him to clear the streets and say in Arabic, make way for the son of David who is coming to see the caliph. It may be an imaginary picture, but it's a very charming one because it illustrates the high status that the leader of the Jewish community had as a kind of a quasi-royalty in the Islamic world. Given that background, the religious leadership of the Jewish community of Baghdad became the religious leadership of the Islamic world, which meant for practical purposes the whole Jewish world, since 95% of the Jewish population of the world lived in Arabic-speaking Islamic territories. Internal Jewish disputes are also argued in the presence of the caliph. For example, the central Jewish confrontation of the Middle Ages the leader of the Jews in Babylon, the Gaon, disputes with the leader of the academy in Jerusalem for the right to determine the time of the new moon. Finally, Babylon wins through. The argument is of great significance because the Jewish calendar is based on the lunar cycle. The new moon always falls on the first day of the month. The person who determines the time of the new moon makes decisions about the calendar and therefore also decides when Jews all around the world keep their festivals. In 711 AD, Islam reaches Europe. The armies of the Moors and the Berbers conquer the Iberian Peninsula. They will not finally be dislodged for nearly 800 years. Many Jews welcome the Muslim conquerors. They've been settled here since Roman times and proudly call themselves Sephardim, after the Hebrew word for Spain. They're hoping for an end to the oppression by the Christian rulers. Cordoba becomes the capital of Muslim Andalusia and the most important center of Jewish life. One of the most famous Jewish philosophers is born here in 1135 AD, Moses ben Maimon, who is also called Maimonides. On his monument in the former Jewish quarter it says, from Moses to Moses, there was none like Moses. Even as a child, Maimonides displayed his insatiable thirst for knowledge. He was fascinated by his father's library, scriptures, Greek philosophers, scientific treatises and Arabic poetry. Later, Maimonides wrote, I devoured every book belonging to my father, bless him, that I could lay my hands on. His father is his first teacher. He works at the rabbinical court and studies under the most famous intellectuals. During the lifetime of Maimonides, Cordoba, the Pearl of Al-Andalus, embodies everything that once defined Islamic Spain. The third largest mosque in the world, the Mesquita, was built here in the 8th century. It speaks of friendly and fruitful coexistence of the different religions. The Caliphate's style combines Roman, Gothic, Byzantine, Syrian and Persian elements. This was the origin of medieval Moorish architecture in Spain. The Caliph's openness draws poets and intellectuals to Cordoba from all around the world. The city is also the spiritual home of Maimonides. Throughout his life he would say, here with us in Al-Andalus. The quarter in which the Jews live is called La Juderia in Spanish. Here is one of the oldest still extant synagogues in Spain. Like all synagogues, it's not directly accessible from the street, but only through a small inner courtyard. The architecture of the building, which was constructed in 1315 AD, shows how well the Jews adapted to their Muslim surroundings. Maimonides' father doesn't just open up the world of scripture to his son, but also the world of the practically applied sciences. 
Andalusia is a rich source of information for the curious boy because it's one of the most significant centers of art and science. Long before the Christians, Arab scholars adopt the knowledge of the ancient Greeks. Arabs develop instruments that have been known since ancient times, astrolabes, instruments used for determining the position of celestial bodies and calculating the time. Moorish Spain plays an important role in the rebirth of ancient knowledge. It's the interface between Arabic culture and Christian Europe. As the Middle Ages progress, it is from Andalusia that the knowledge of the ancient world spreads across Europe. Medicine and botany also reach new heights. Jews take over knowledge and skills and develop them further. It is often they who introduce the new methods and the knowledge to Europe. Jews bore Arabic names and read Arabic books, and they became cultured in the way that Arabs were cultured, which meant that they acquired a knowledge of Arabic literature and of the sciences, because these Greek scientific works very quickly became available in Arabic. And having one language from one end of the Mediterranean to the other, information could pass quickly and easily. Like the rest of the Mediterranean, the Jews were brought together into one large cultural entity. The largely peaceful coexistence ends in 1147. A radical Muslim sect, the Almohads, comes to the Iberian Peninsula from Maghreb. They demand that all those of other faiths convert to Islam. Many Jews flee from the Almohads to the Christian north of Spain, or they try to escape to northern Africa. Maimonides and his family have to flee too. Christians and Jews are both faced by a stark choice convert or emigrate. Later, Maimonides writes, a Jew has to leave a country when he is forced to break the divine law. Under no circumstances should he stay in a place where he would be forced to convert. Whoever stays in such a place desecrates the divine name. The family is on the run for the next 10 years. They settle in Fez, in modern day Morocco. During the Middle Ages, the town is considered an important cultural center of the Islamic world. It doesn't look very different now from what it looked like then. Even the craftsmen work just as they did when Maimonides was alive. He's said to have lived in this house in the Rue des Orlogues. A good 200 years later, most of North Africa's Jews were living in this quarter. Until a few decades ago, there were synagogues, communal kitchens, ritual baths and schools. Fez was a famous Jewish center. Between 1950 and 1980, many Jews left Morocco. Around 1950, 30,000 Jews still lived here. Today, it's only some 300. When the Almohads seized the power in Fez too, a new period of religious oppression begins for the Maimon family. From now on, it's convert to Islam or die. Maimonides witnesses the execution of the chief rabbi of Fez He'd refuse to forswear his faith. Maimonides and his family have no option but to flee again. This time they embark on a very long and dangerous journey. First they spend 28 days on a ship and then they continue on foot. They settle in Al Fustat in Egypt. At the time, it was a suburb of Cairo, the capital of the Muslim rulers in Egypt. By 1100 AD, 7,000 Jews from all around the world have settled here. There are three Jewish congregations in Fustat. Each has its own synagogue. Maimonides is said to have prayed in the Ben Ezra synagogue. According to legend, this is where Moses had drifted ashore in a basket as a baby. The Jews bought the land and built a synagogue on this biblical site. To earn his living, Maimonides works as a doctor. He wants to comprehend God as much as is humanly possible. Alongside the other sciences, medicine is one of the most exquisite God-serving occupations, a widespread view amongst Jewish intellectuals, many of whom also work as doctors. Besides working as a doctor, he composed the Mishneh Torah and the Guide for the Confused, a manual for Jews all around the world. It was his goal that every Jew should understand the fundamentals of the oral teachings and be able to live according to the traditions. Maimonides died on the 13th of December 1204 at the age of 69. 
In Jewish communities all around the world, they mourn his death. Even today, he's considered one of the greatest Jewish intellectuals and the most outstanding representative of the Sephardim, the Spanish Jews. For the Jews in Maimonides' home country, Spain, though, a new era has already begun. Christian rulers reconquer the Muslim cities. The Sephardic Jews are faced by a new challenge in their confrontation with Christianity. Charlemagne's interest wasn't just economic. For him, Jews were living proof of the truth of the Christian gospel, and he saw himself as a descendant of the biblical kings, David and Solomon. Soon, important Jewish communities established themselves in Mainz, Speyer, and Worms. They maintain close links amongst each other and call themselves Shum, after the three first letters of the place names in Hebrew. Since Shum is also the Hebrew word for garlic, the plant becomes a symbol of this alliance. It didn't take long for the fame of these three cities to reach across the borders of the empire. In the mid-10th century, some of the Kolonimos family settle in Mainz. The city belongs to Ashkenaz. That's what the Jews call the settlement area along the River Rhine. Later, this term will be applied to all of Germany, France, and also Eastern Europe. Religious education is considered a high social ideal amongst the Jews. Rabbis and scholars increased the fame and standing of a family. This was also Kalonimos ben Mushalem's path. His parents decided to pay to send their eldest son to the yeshiva, the Jewish academy. The plan is that he become a rabbi and give his full attention to his studies and the scriptures. In return, his parents are willing to support him for the rest of his life. Young Kalonimos has great role models. One of them is Shlomo ben Itzak, called Rashi. This rabbi and scholar came to Worms from Troy in France to study in 1055. Rashi's commentaries on the Torah and the Talmud are still taught today. The yeshiva and synagogue were destroyed by the Nazis, but they have been restored, and now they recall the heyday of Jewish spiritual life in the Middle Ages. Emperor Henry IV's customs exemption privilege of 1074 is in the Worms city archive. It documents the special standing of the Jewish citizens. It guaranteed them economic freedoms and rights for long-distance trade and is the first deed ever to have been issued to Jewish citizens of a town by a German king. This was a time when there were only a few Jews in a few cities, a time when there weren't many cities. Everything was very small scale. It was a time during which, on the whole, the Jews had a relatively high social standing in Northern Europe. Small numbers and socially in a better position than most of their surroundings. The number of Jews in the Ashkenazi area increases during the 11th century. From being internationally active traders working for princes and bishops, they become urban merchants. They don't live in isolation, but in contact with many Christians. But their business acumen causes jealousy amongst some of their Christian competitors. Kalonimos ben Mushalem is a rabbi in Mainz. He, too, is an esteemed citizen of Mainz, both amongst the Jews and the Christians. At this time, the conflicts between the traders are only petty rivalries. Right into the late 11th century, Jews and Christians live together mostly in peace. The Jews frequently live together in a quarter or in a street near the marketplace. That is practical both for trading and for mutual support. But it also makes possible a life in accordance with the halakha, the Jewish religious law with Jewish butchers, bakers and doctors. And the synagogue is not allowed to be any further away than one kilometer on the Sabbath, Friday evening. The synagogue is the center of the community as a place for prayer but also a place of assembly. Women aren't permitted to enter the inner area out of a fear that they could distract the men. They stay in the adjoining room during the service. The mikvah is also close by. The ritual bath in Speyer is one of the best preserved from the Middle Ages in Europe. Men and women visited it particularly on feast days to symbolically free themselves of all physical and spiritual impurities. According to Jewish law, the ritual bath is only allowed to be fed by living, that is, running water. Only spring water or groundwater can be used. A Jewish woman has to visit the bath after her menstruation, before her wedding, or after a birth. She has to immerse herself completely three times. The immersion of the entire body symbolizes the passage into a new phase. At the same time, she has to recite a word of praise. 
It is a ritual from biblical times that Jews follow to this day. Once cleansed, the woman is allowed to return to her husband's bed, since while she is menstruating, contact between husband and wife is prohibited. Despite the many rules, the Jewish women of the Middle Ages do not live in isolation. In the woman's world, the religious tension was less. Christian and Jewish women talked about mutual women's issues that didn't have a religious aspect. Working together, understanding and similarity were all much greater amongst women. This peaceful coexistence that has existed for decades is threatened by the call to the Crusades. In November 1095, Pope Urban II convenes a council in clermont ferrand On the penultimate day, he calls for the liberation of the holy city of Jerusalem, which has been ruled by Muslims for 400 years. Arm yourselves with God's zeal. Gird your swords to your sides. It is better to die in battle than to see our people and the saints suffer. Pope Urban spoke of destruction in Jerusalem and assaults on pilgrims. His appeal, both the rich and the poor should set out to come to the aid of the Christians in the Orient. Deus lo volt, God wishes it, is the closing sentence of his speech. Thousands follow him enthusiastically. Everyone feels called to become a crusader. Religious fanatics, impoverished nobles, peasants with no rights, day laborers and the unemployed. They all want to be a part of Christ's army. Their symbol is a cross made of cloth. They are convinced that they are fighting for a great cause and so they leave for Jerusalem. As a reward for their willingness to fight, the Pope promises them the forgiveness of all their sins and eternal life. Not all self-proclaimed crusaders leave for Jerusalem. There are unbelievers in our own country too, they say. Shortly after the speech by Pope Urban, the first assaults take place in France. The call for help from French fellow believers reaches Rabbi Kalonimos ben Mushalem in Mainz. The crusaders he reads are said to have murdered dozens of Jews. Kalonimos beseeches his community to protect themselves, but most don't take his warning seriously. Their message to France? We will fast and help you in every way, but we have nothing to fear. They are convinced that the Bishop of Mainz wants to protect them, but Kalonimos is doubtful. He hopes for God's support. His fears are justified. The Crusaders come from France to the Rhineland, and soon the armed mob is standing at the gates of the Shum cities. What happened next is described in the writings of the so-called Anonymous of Mainz and the Jewish chronicler Salomo Bar Simpson. Outside the gates of Mainz, the French Crusaders join forces with Germans eager to fight. Itinerant preachers incite the angry crowd. They speak of Jewish God-murderers and vow the forgiveness of all sins. Mainz is home to over a thousand Jews. Kalonimos sends a messenger with gold to the Crusaders. They promise clemency, but for how long? They want to set an example against the infidel in their midst. Kalonimos at home with his family. They still hope against hope that the gold will change the mind of the mob. He writes a letter to the German Emperor, Henry IV, to appeal for help, but to no avail. Kalonimos and his family can only wait. Just hours later, the self-proclaimed Crusaders attack Mainz. Christian citizens had opened the city gates to them. Jews are slain in their homes. Many seek protection in the bishop's palace, but the bishop has already fled. Kalonimos and other Jews arm themselves, but they're powerless against the numerically superior attackers. Death or baptism is their battle cry. Kalonimos returns home in the certainty that he won't be able to save his family. A contemporary witness wrote, But when the Jews saw how the Christians turned against their children and showed no mercy to people of any age, they aimed their arms against themselves and against their own fellow believers, against their own women and children, mothers and sister, and began killing each other. The Jews call this suicide the Kiddush Hashem, the sanctification of God's name. It was the only way to preserve their faith. This heroic glorification of the Kiddush Hashem can be found in medieval paintings.
The memory of the persecution of the First Crusade was traumatic. It shaped the collective mentality of the Ashkenazi Jews and continues to do so today in a number of different areas. The prayers that were written down, recorded and built into the liturgy in memory of those that were murdered, we recite them to this day. The image of a fanatical mob that attacked the helpless Jews was formed during those months between spring and autumn in 1096. The great Jewish congregations of the Shum cities had now been destroyed. More than a thousand Jews died in Mainz. The Crusaders moved on with their rich bounty. It is said that some victims of the Crusades lie buried in the cemetery in Worms. It is one of the oldest remaining Jewish cemeteries in Germany. Only slowly did Jewish life recover in Germany. Together with the cities, the number of Jewish citizens also grew again in the 13th century. One of the biggest communities arose in Cologne. The Jewish quarter was close to the city hall. Remains of the neighborhood were excavated in 1953. They documented the affluence of the community. The Jews profited from Cologne being an important trading city that also regularly hosted trade fairs. Besides a synagogue, a mikvah, a bakery, a playhouse and homes, a Jewish hospice was also found. Christians and Jews were living beside each other in this quarter, and one can see during the course of the 12th century how the Jewish population increased more strongly compared to the Christian population. This is because Jews were buying or leasing houses from Christians or even from churches, and this is how a closed Jewish quarter established itself by the mid-13th century. But it's not a ghetto that was closed off to the outside. It was just a desire to live together, to settle together around the synagogue, but it was by no means forced. The historical archive in Cologne contains documents about the history of the quarter. The Jewish shrine register with a plan attached is a medieval land register. They state who lived where, who was related to whom, and which properties were split up or merged. In addition, there are purchase contracts and documents for neighborly business transactions. Everyday business was resolved in them. For example, how high a wall between two properties was allowed to be. In the 12th century, 26 houses were in the ownership of Jewish citizens. They had rights and duties just like all the city's other inhabitants too. They were enlisted for defense purposes, for example, and they guarded a part of the city walls in times of crisis. They had night watch duties, just like all the other inhabitants of Cologne. They were protected by the council, but they didn't have access to other areas of public life. In this way, one can characterize their status as quasi-citizens, but not necessarily as citizens in the full sense. They aren't allowed to take public office. They can't become city councillors. Cologne Cathedral houses the Jewish privilege of 1266. In it, Archbishop Engelbert ensured them fair treatment. It was an important signal on the part of the official church because the hostility of the Christians towards the Jews was growing. In the north of England, an accusation begins to circle that gives rise to a new form of hatred of Jews in Europe. Shortly before Easter, a boy named William goes missing in Norwich. The inhabitants look for him in the forest that borders the town. They make a gruesome discovery. William has been murdered. The search for the guilty party is over in no time. The rumor arises that the Jews are to blame. Domestic staff from the house of a rich Jew are willing to testify to everything. At first, the church and public officials react negatively towards the suggestion and discourage assaults on the Jewish population. The case is closed. Then, a few years later, the Benedictine monk, Thomas of Monmouth, arrives in Norwich. In a seven-volume work titled On the Life and Suffering of the Holy Martyr William of Norwich, he accuses the Jews of being responsible for his murder. They had killed William for ritual reasons in the Holy Week before Easter. The historian, Robin Mundell, has intensively studied Thomas of Monmouth and the case of William. Thomas of Monmouth was successful with his allegations, partly because I believe there was a first for a saint. A cathedral without a shrine really needs some sort of focus. And pilgrimage was obviously a very big industry in medieval times, in the 12th, 13th centuries. Pilgrimage brought in trade, people, and importance. And therefore Norwich didn't actually have a saint. 
and so the murdered boy becomes Saint William. Even if the church never canonized him officially, his grave in Norwich Cathedral was a place of pilgrimage for centuries. Soon, similar accusations follow everywhere in Europe. As soon as a child goes missing, the Jews are suspected. They are accused of using the children's blood for their unleavened bread at Passover.